All right, this is the ninth week of our course. We will be working on bootstrapping and ensemble learning this week. Let's make a quick review of the previous week. Last week we have seen k-means clustering and mean shift clustering. Basically, we have seen some uh, theoretical and practical concepts about clustering. So these are unsupervised techniques. And the mostly used techniques concerning the clustering are k-means and mean shift clustering. And we have seen the definition of clustering. Uh, that's an unsupervised learning method. And it's grouping a set of objects in a way that objects in the same cluster are more similar to each other than those in other groups. Which basically means you are creating groups and this is done usually automatically by getting some clues from you and things that are in the same group or the same cluster are kind of similar okay that's basically the idea of clustering we have seen there are quite a lot of clustering techniques and the thing is there is no best clustering technique the whole thing depends on your data as you see from this example and this is kind of a good clustering, but this is a fish clustering. This is not a good clustering for this data set. So th there is no uh, such a thing that, as the perfect clustering technique. And concerning the k-means clustering, that's a simple algorithm. Basically, we decide the number of clusters. This is important. We, we need to first select the number of classes. Otherwise, the k-means clustering doesn't work. And then we randomly initialize their center points of the clusters. Then for each point in our data sets, we find the distance between that point and the cluster centers. And we assign that point to the closest cluster center. Okay. After we calculate and uh, assign all the points to one cluster, we recalculate the centers of the clusters. For example, in this example, we have three clusters, okay? So we randomly initialize the cluster centers. And then in each iteration, we assign these points to one cluster. For example, these guys are in red cluster for now. But as the cluster center moves in this direction, the points here becomes red as well, okay? So in each iteration, we recalculate the cluster center and if we come to a point that we cannot move the cluster center anymore or if we come to a point uh, where the maximum iteration number is reached then we stop basically and uh, the advantages of k-means clustering that's pretty easy to implement very intuitive and it's very fast the disadvantages number of clusters needs to be known that's uh, a non-trivial issue and we have seen a method called elbow methods basically that you may be using for finding the number of clusters but anyhow it's pretty difficult to uh, find out the number of clusters you, you need to use and that's a non-trivial issue as it starts with random cluster centers it may yield to different clustering results we have seen some techniques to overcome this but in any case, since we start with random cluster centers, the clustering results may change. And then we have seen something called mean shift clustering. Okay, this is uh, another widely used clustering method. And the idea behind mean shift clustering is it's a sliding meadow based algorithm that attempts to find the dense areas of the data points. Okay. Here we don't need to actually know the number of clusters, but here we need to know the radius of the circle. This was our search radius, okay? And given a data set, some, that data set something like this, we start from a random point. For example, we start here. We calculate the centroid of the points inside the search radius and then we move towards that centroid okay in this case the centroid of the points 
that falls within this circle is this, right? And in the second iteration, we move the center of this cluster to here. And we keep doing this until we cannot move the cluster center anymore. And the idea is the dance points are called sync points. And at some point, wherever you start, you will end up on a sync point. For example, if you start from here, you will follow a route something like this. You will come to a dancer area and then you will end up in the sync point. And while you are traveling in this road, everything, every data point you passed is considered from this class. Okay. And if, for example, you started from this point, since you are moving towards a dancer area, you come to here, you will end up something like this. And you will end up here. Okay. You will end up in this sync point. So the basic idea behind mean shift algorithm is it automatically calculates the number of clusters. It doesn't need to know uh, it beforehand. It just asks you the search radius. And if you give a big search radius, then the algorithm works slowly. If you use a small radius, then you may have other problems. But in any case, mean shift algorithm works very slowly. You need to know this. If you, for example, use mean shift clustering for image segmentation that takes ages, it's usually a very uh, nice algorithm. It gives quite good results. The only drawback about mean shift clustering is it's slow. Okay. We have seen a lot of clustering algorithms, but out of all these clustering algorithms, k-means and mean shift clustering, you should know by heart. So they are the most widely used clustering algorithms. And revisiting the quiz of last week, k in k-means clustering represents the number of clusters to be found, basically. k-means initial clusters are formed randomly. That's true. The cluster centers in k-means are uh, initialized randomly. Clustering is a supervised learning algorithm that's unsupervised learning. Uh, you need to know this. You need to know this by heart. Mean shift algorithm moves the center, cluster center to dancer areas. Yes, that's basically the idea behind mean shift algorithm. Mean shift algorithm works very fast. That's really false. That's not just false. This is very false. As the number of features increase, KNN may suffer from curse of dimensionality. That's true. Principal component analysis is calculated from eigenvalues and eigenvectors of covariance metrics. Mean shift algorithm requires the initial number of clusters. That's false. It basically automatically finds the number of clusters. Or I think it's a better idea to say mean shift calculates automatically emerges uh, the clusters okay in mean shift the technique to find k for k means algorithm is called elbow method the pca component that describes the data more is the one with highest eigenvalue that's true as well okay so this is the outline of this week we will be starting with a concept called bootstrapping and then we will be seeing what ensemble learning is, what are the key concepts, then we will be seeing some ensemble learning methods, namely begging, random forest, boosting, and inside boosting, we will be seeing other boost and gradient boosting. So let's start with bootstrapping. That's difficult to pronounce, looks fancy, but the idea is pretty simple. Inference about a population from sample data can be modeled by resampling the sample data and performing the inference about a sample from resampled data. That sounds like a puzzle. Just to make it more clear, let's say we have a data set something like this, okay? And then we perform some statistics, some sample statistics. I mean, let's say we calculated the number of greens, for example, or we calculated the number of purples, or we calculated the average color somehow, okay? Let's say we 
calculated some sample statistics from these data sets. The idea behind bootstrap is you create new data sets or new samples from this initial sample. And you can basically use any elements inside this initial sample more than once. And once you come up with this new subsamples or new samples, and if you calculate the previous statistics from these samples and you somehow combine them, you basically calculate more or less the same statistics. That's the basic idea behind bootstrapping. So, in summary, bootstrapping is the method to calculate a statistics from the resampled data. And you will see why we do something like this. Let's say we would like to calculate the average height of every people worldwide. So th this is not doable. I mean, you cannot ask, go back, go and ask everybody their height, right? So you, you need to f somehow find a method in order to calculate the average height of uh, people worldwide. So from some sample, let's say we have n people, we can only calculate one estimator. We can only calculate one mean, right? And this is not sufficient. In order to reason about the population, we need some sense of variability of the mean that we computed, okay? And the simplest bootstrap method involves taking the original data set of heights for these unsamples, sampling from it to form a new sample that we call resample or the bootstrap sample. That's also size of n. Or it can be smaller than n. It, it shouldn't be bigger than n. But the basic idea is we have some samples, we resample the samples, and then we calculate the statistics from these new resamples. And this is actually how the election uh, statistics or election questionnaires work. You cannot go and ask everybody uh, which party they will elect. Right? But this is not possible. And uh, most of the people will not answer. You select a sample people, okay? From that sample people, you create resamples. And from these resamples, you basically calculate your statistics. And in this example, we were behind the average height of every people on the planet. And let's say we have uh, like 10 people. And out of 10 people, we would like to calculate the average height of everybody on Earth. Okay. Therefore, we need to create a lot of samples from these 10 people. And as you see, that's our first bootstrap sample. This is the second bootstrap sample. This is the amp bootstrap sample. And as you see, we can use the same sample more than once. For example, this woman is inside this set two times. This guy is inside the set two times. This girl is inside the set two times. And it doesn't need to be that way. For example, this boy is inside one time. And if you take a look at this, some of the samples are not even inside this set. Okay. But you create a lot of these samples. And once you create a lot of these samples and do the statistics on these samples, you basically come up with a more robust statistic. Okay. For example, if you would like to calculate the mean average, instead of calculating the average from these people, if you bootstrap and create a lot of resampled data sets and take the mean of each data set, then you can see the variation of the average heights. So that's basically the idea behind bootstrapping. Now, imagine we had a new drug to treat an illness, okay? And we made an experiment on eight people. And let's say the drug is too expensive, so you don't want to make more experiments. And you would like to understand whether the drug is making people feel better or feel worse, okay? 
And out of these eight people, you see that there are three people that feel worse when they take the drug. And there are five people that feel better when they take the drug. Um, when you get the mean of their response, that's basically something like 0 0.5 and this is pretty close to zero which means the drug may be not effective at all i mean it's not either making people feel better or uh, making feel uh, worse but it's difficult to tell because we use just eight people for our experiments and we have only one mean and we basically don't know how this mean actually moves if we add more people or if you move, uh, remove some people, okay? So what we can do is basically we can use bootstrapping. We create a lot of samples uh, from this out of this eight people, and we take the mean of all our bootstrap samples. Then we come up with a histogram something like this, okay? And the way we do it, basically, is we actually take samples. We can repeat the samples. For example, we, we repeat this uh, pink and the green sample uh, more than once. And out of these eight people, we create resamples or bootstrap samples that have eight people as well. And this is called sampling with replacements. Okay. Please try to remember this term, sampling with replacements. That's how we create our bootstrap resamples. And once we do this a lot of times, let's say we created 10,000 of these bootstrap samples and calculate their means and putting them uh, on a histogram, we end up something like this. Okay. And in this histogram, we can basically see the variation of the mean and the accumulation of the mean is around zero and we can now be sure that the drug is not effective because it's basically accumulated within this region okay and th this statistics was calculated from out of eight people that's the good thing about bootstrapping. You don't need a lot of samples, basically. You can just use a very small subset. That's how the companies that are trying to estimate the elections do as well. They use quite a f uh, small number of people. They use like 100 people. And that they can come up with pretty good results. And th this is how they do it. They use bootstrapping. Okay, now let's make a small example about bootstrapping. So in this example, we will try to find the mean of some random numbers. And then we will be using bootstrapping to calculate the mean of these numbers from their resampled bootstraps. Okay. So <clears throat> Basically, we calculate or we create uh, 1000 random numbers and then we get the mean of these numbers by just using the uh, NumPy mean. Okay. And this is basically the mean of these random uh, list selected numbers. And we created the random numbers basically. Uh, within 300, so we calculated uh, or we created 1000 samples around 300 and therefore their mean is basically something around 300. So th this is basic mean calculation. Now we will try to find the same statistics. In this case, our statistics is calculation of the mean, okay, from 50 bootstraps. Um, in order to do that, we will basically get some samples from our initial sets, calculate the, calculate the mean of these samples, 
and now we will calculate the mean of these means right so here we basically created our uh, resamples we got uh, four out of this 1000 uh, samples in each iteration and then once we calculate basically the mean we actually end up with more or less the same mean something around 300 okay so this is the power of bootstrapping instead of directly calculating a statistics you resample your data and then you calculate your statistics from this data therefore you can basically see the variation uh, within your statistics with this technique so this was basically our bootstrapping concepts now we will be starting the ensemble learning and we will start with the motivation what ensemble learning is and uh, why do we need a technique something like this so let's start with basic analogy the motivation behind ensemble learning is unity is strength ensemble means you basically assemble stuff together okay using some stuff together uh, the uh, dictionary meaning of ensemble is and just remember this unity is strength so the idea is combining multiple models together can often produce a much more powerful model and some analogies uh, to strengthen this idea for example we make elections to combine voters choices to pick a good candidate like and committees combine experts opinions to make better decisions so if you have more than one people to decide on something it's highly likely that you decide it in a better way that's the basic intuition behind ensemble learning you combine some models you combine some predictors okay that's basically the idea behind ensemble learning and how do we combine basically uh, we call weak learners or base models that can be used as building blocks for designing more complex models by combining several of them okay that's how we basically do uh, or we create ensemble learning models most of the time these basic models perform not so well by themselves so that, that's why they are called weak learners or base models but once we combine several weak learners together in order to create a strong learner then we can achieve with a better performance so combining all this stuff combining this weak learner score is called ensembling and how does it work assume that we have three decision algorithms okay the first one is decision tree algorithm and it has an accuracy of this that, that's not good that's not bad either let's say we have support vector machines with an accuracy of 75 percent and we have logistic regression with an accuracy of 60 percent and assume that we are trying to solve a problem if we use any of these methods just one of these methods the best we can achieve is most probably with support vector machines and it's 75 percent accuracy but if we combine these decision makers or these models it is highly likely that we come up with a much better decision maker okay that's the idea behind ensemble learning let's say we are trying to classify this image and our decision tree says this is a hot dog our support vector machine says this is a hot dog but our logistic regression says this is not a hot dog and if we simply use majority voting then two of our decision makers voted for hot dog and one of our decision makers voted for not hot dog right and since we have two hot dog and one not hot dog, hot dog this image is classified as hot dog this is basically the power of 
combining more than one decision maker. Even if one of your decision maker makes a mistake, if more of your decision makers could be able to work in a good way, then your overall ensembled combined model perform well. Okay, that's the basic idea behind ensemble learning. And how does it work? Remember bootstrapping. We will be using bootstrapping a lot with ensemble learning. So this is how we basically create our samples. We have a data set. From this data set, we create bootstrap resamples. And we somehow train a lot of models. And from these models, we make a unified decision. So as you see, we have uh, these arrows from this direction, from this direction. Uh, at the end of the lecture, you will see why we have uh, basically two arrows, actually. But for now, just remember this. We resample our data, basically. And then we use a lot of models. And then the final decision is made out of all these models. That's the basic idea behind ensemble learning. So we have two major categories, homogeneous weak learners and heterogeneous weak learners. Uh, and if we use homogeneous weak learners, we only have a single base learning algorithm. Let's say if we use the decision tree as the base algorithm or uh, base model, or to say the weak learner, then all of our uh, decision makers should be decision trees. But if you are using heterogeneous weak learners, then you can basically combine more than one uh, type of decision makers. And for today's lecture, we will be seeing basically two methods. One is called begging and one is called boosting. These are homogeneous, basically weak learners. And then uh, staking is a heterogeneous method and we will not be seeing staking in this lecture. We will start with begging. That's easier than boosting. And then uh, we will be seeing some examples about boosting as well. Okay, so what is begging actually? When training a model, we obtain a function that takes an input, returns an output, and that is defined with respect to the, with respect to the training data sets. Right. If another data set had been observed, we would have obtained a different model while training. So let's say we have a decision tree and we somehow found some samples from somewhere. And we trained our decision tree and based on this training, our decision tree makes some decisions, right? But if we use another data set for training, then we will end up with a different decision tree. If you remember from our decision tree lecture, everything changes with respect to the training. The shape of the tree, the levels of the tree, everything changes with respect to our training uh, samples. And the idea behind begging is, that's basically called bootstrap aggregating, or uh, shortly it's begging. We use the same model with different data sets. Okay, so we fit several independent models and average their predictions. And we can't in practice fit fully independent models because it would require infinitely many data. But we can use bootstrapping to produce semi-independent models from the data. Okay, so that's why we first worked on bootstrapping. We need to understand bootstrapping. We need to understand that bootstrapping is creating semi-independent resamples from our sample data set. Okay. And then out of this sample data sets, we create more than one model and then combine their decisions. So this is basically how begging works. It's pretty simple. This is our initial data set, right? We have nine characters 
nine unique characters. And then out of these nine unique characters, let's say we created three subsamples or resamples. Okay, with sampling with replacements. We created these three new samples. And then let's say we have a decision tree model. And we created our decision tree model with this data set. We trained it with this data set. And then we came up with model one. And we trained our decision tree with this data set. And we came up with model two. And then we used this resampled data set in order to train the decision tree. And we came up with model three. Since we trained the same decision tree with different samples, we basically obtained three different decision trees that should basically make three different decisions about a given sample. Okay. And then the basic idea behind begging is we combine the decisions of these three models. And we will see how we can combine this. But the basic, for example, uh, thing you can use is majority voting. If this says, for example, whatever you would like to classify is A and A, but this says whatever you would like to classify as is E, since we have two A's and one E, the thing will be classified as an A. So this is the power of combining more than one weak learner, basically. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is just to say, let's say uh, we have ZBL. This is the beta observation of the alt boost trap. So from our uh, samples, we create L boost traps and we can fit L almost independent weak learners. Since we have L resampled boost traps, we can fit L almost independent weak learners. And once we basically create these weak learners, independent weak learners, we can combine them or aggregate them into some kind of averaging process. And in this case, this is just averaging or uh, taking the mean of their decisions or uh, taking an average uh, majority voting. Okay. That's another example. Let's say we have five hypotheses and we would like to classify this instance. And the classification works on the majority voting. And for the classification to be wrong, at least three out of five hypotheses would be wrong. And this is highly unlikely. I mean, you have five hypotheses, even if they are weak learners. I mean, we, we have seen a lot of examples, for example, with decision trees. Even if we use the crappiest, simplest stuff, we usually obtain an accuracy more than 50%, right? And if we combine these crappy, very bad weak learners, it's highly likely that out of five, we have three wrong decisions. Therefore, if you use a lot of hypotheses, then it's highly likely that you will make the right decision. So let's see another example about uh, begging. Let's say we have this data, we use n number of this for training and uh, we, we will be using 40% of uh, the data for testing and we have m bags which means we have uh, m different models that will uh, make decisions for us and we have n number of uh, data points in our data sets we have m prime number of uh, samples in our bags these are our bags And what we do with begging is basically we train one model from the guys, from the samples from this bag. This is our first model. And then we train another 
model from the samples inside this bag and we do the same uh, for the rest and at the end we have M models and we all train this with N samples okay and we basically during the inference phase we basically get the mean of their decisions the decision of these models and the, the idea to combine these guys is to just take the means and then you will come up with a decision that's basically the idea behind baking so we train stuff in parallel that's one thing you should remember while we are using baking we train everything in parallel because these are independent models so this is our initial data set let's say we will be using L bootstrap samples from this initial data set we create L samples and we use these L samples to train independent models so whatever you train here doesn't affect anything in this model and whatever you train here doesn't affect anything anywhere okay these are just independent models this this is gonna be the basic difference between begging and boosting in begging everything is independent everything works in parallel and the decision is made by combining all the decisions out of these independent decision makers okay that's that's basically the idea behind begging so some common questions about begging uh, what algorithm should be used in the ensemble the algorithm should have a moderate variance meaning it's moderately dependent upon the specific training data the decision tree is the default model please remember this decision tree is the default model to use because it works well in practice some other algorithms may be used as well another question how many ensemble members should be used the performance of the model will converge with the increase of the number of decision trees to a point and then remain uh, level so you don't need to use infinitely many uh, models want ensemble overfit to uh, many trees that's basically no the idea behind ensemble learning is to overcome the problem of overfitting okay please remember this as well if you remember from the decision tree lecture decision trees have the tendency to overfit and they were really overfitting quite nicely and in order to uh, overcome this overfitting problem we use ensemble learning another question how large should the bootstrap sample be it's good practice to make the bootstrap samples as large as the original data sets why because if you have let's say n samples and if you use sub samples that's too smaller than this number n then the statistics will change a lot and the variation uh, between the statistics statistics will be too different so it's always a good idea to use a number that's close to the original data set size okay what problems are well suited to begging Generally, begging is well suited to problems with small or modest sized data sets. Okay, these are the things to remember about begging. And in summary, we use homogeneous weak learners as base learners for begging. Each base learner is trained with the bootstrap data. Please remember this bootstrapping and begging, they are brothers and sisters. Decision and training of every weak learner is done independently. This is important as well. This is basically the most important uh, thing about begging. It works in parallel. Okay, everything is independent. Every model you train, every weak learner you train, they are independent. Decision of the weak learners are somehow combined to get the final decision. So this is basically the summary of begging. Okay, let's see our first example about begging. As usual, we import our uh, Python libraries. Here we will be using 
make pipeline and begin classifier we will be using grid search cv here as well uh, in order to calculate the best parameters for our uh, models here we will be using a data set inside uh, our uh, python libraries it's called uh, breast cancer data set basically that's coming with the stuff we installed so it should be inside your computer as well and then uh, we use train and test speed as usual 25% uh, for testing and rest for the training and then here we will be calculating something called pipeline estimator and what it does is it basically creates a pipeline and it creates a new model which is combination of two operations okay that's why it's called a pipeline and if you remember from uh, previous lectures for logistic regression to work in a good way we need to scale the data okay so the first thing is we scale the data and then we apply logistic regression and this make pipeline commands basically combines these two commands so it says whatever data you receive you first scale it and then you apply logistic regression and this is our new model the pipeline okay and this is pretty similar to our model def definition phase we defined the model now we need to train the model and this is how we do we we use the fit function and it's pretty much the same and once we basically uh, use logistic regression we come up with something like this okay now we will be using logistic regression uh, or the same pipeline as the base estimator for our begging classifier so here we just use one decision maker which is log logistic regression right but the idea behind uh, begging was we were going to use more than one uh, decision maker and in this case our decision maker is we scale the data and then we use logistic regression this could be decision tree or this could be support vector machine as well it could have been any classifier for this problem but right now we are using logistic regression so the idea is we first define our base estimator which in this case is standard scalar plus logistic regression and this is important as well we define the number of estimators which means we will use 100 logistic regression decision makers in the begging classifier okay and once we do this let's see the results you see in the first case for the test data the test score was the, the accuracy uh, was 0 0.96 but now we open 0 0.95 so there is a slight decrease uh, in the performance but the generalization power of the model increased because the test and training scores are pretty close to each other in the previous example you see the training score is pretty high but the testing score is kind of lower than that but with this example uh, with the begging classifier we obtain similar results for uh, testing and training data okay so this is basically how we use begging classifier we define a base estimator this base estimator could be anything a decision tree a logistic regressor a support vector machine and then we define the number of estimators and this number of estimators basically are this parallel working these guys this this stuff so in this case for example l is 100 we divided our initial data sets into 100 bootstrapped resamples and then we trained 100 independent logistic regressor and then our begging classifier combined these 100 begging classifiers to make the final decision
Okay. Let's make another uh, example. This is going to be from Seaborn, uh, the Titanic dataset. So we first import our Python libraries as we do usual, and then we load datasets from Seaborn, the Titanic dataset. Let's see the shape. Uh, we have 15 columns and uh, 800 rows. Let's see what we have inside this data. So we basically, we have the passenger class, we have the gender, uh, we have the age, and a lot of stuff. And as the class, we have survived or non-survived. Okay, zeros are non-survived, ones are survived. As we do usually, we first need to make a data pre-processing. So we need to make our data ready for processing. Okay. So we have 15 columns. We're not going to use uh, all the columns. Therefore, we will be choosing some stuff. For example, uh, passenger class, gender, age, and uh, survived we will be using. And we will be dropping nouns. Uh, you, you see there are some nouns and other stuff. We will be dropping them. And then as X, we will be using passenger class sex and age. And we will be using survived for the Y value. So we will be using this. We converted some. Uh, we have gender as male and female. And as we remember from our previous lectures, we need to convert this to a numerical value either by using one hat encoder or uh, label encoder. Whatever we use, we need to have uh, zeros and ones. Since there are two genders, we can basically define one for uh, male and zero for female. Now let's see the shape of X. We have three columns. We have this many uh, rows. We dropped rows with nonce. Remember that, and we can take a look at basically the mean standard deviation, minimum and maximum of the data by using the uh, describe of pandas data frame, and we can get further information about our x values by using info. And uh, there is nothing wrong. We have integer, integer, and float values, and for the y value. We will be using survived, and since it was already zeros and one, we don't need to convert it uh, to any numerical values. And as you see, we have 424 zeros and 290 ones in our y uh, value. So now we have our x value and the y value. Now we will be defining our model, and we will be fitting our model. Uh, for that, we will be using decision tree classifier and begging uh, classifier. As usual, we will be splitting our dataset into train and tests. We will be using 30% of our data for uh, testing and 70% of our data for training. Here we have a function that's basically getting the classifier as the input. We can define any classifier. We are getting the train test uh, sets for X and train and test sets for Y. And we get whether that's the training set or the test set. Okay. And that's basically doing the prediction and doing the evaluation. Okay. Uh, you can just go through that function, but it's just basically getting the classifier as the inputs and doing the prediction, uh, doing the fitting and the prediction with this classifier. And then it's calculating the performance values. Okay. So let's see what we will have uh, when we use decision tree classifier. So our classifier is this one. We will be fitting or we will be training this decision tree classifier and then we will be printing the scores uh, for testing and training. Okay. 
And as you see, we have an accuracy of uh, almost 90% for training and uh, we have 85, 0 uh, 85 for testing, which is not bad actually, that's quite fine. Now let's use the same model, which was decision tree classifier, remember, CRF is equal to decision tree classifier for begging. Okay, for the base estimator, we will be using decision trees and we will have 1000 estimators for the begging classifier. Okay, and let's fit to the data that will take up bit time because uh, in parallel we trained basically 1000 uh, models and then let's see the result. So it's more or less same for the training, you see. And for the testing it even dropped. So it was zero points. It's more or less same. It's not it's, it's not that different. So by using the begging we obtained similar results, but it's more stable. Now we know actually uh, the variation is stable behind our decisions because we use uh, the same decision maker 1000 times with uh, different data. Okay, so that's how basically begging works. Now let's say another application of begging, which is called random forests. And then we will continue with uh, boosting. So random forests is a supervised learning algorithm. The forest it builds is an ensemble of decision trees. In this case, we always use decision trees. This is important. And we train it with begging methods. So what we call as random forest is what we did uh, in the previous example. So we use decision trees. We used begging that was basically creating a random forest. It's just a fancy name uh, for assembling decision trees with begging. Okay. Random forest pulls multiple decision trees and merges them together to get a more accurate and stable prediction. That's the same thing with begging. It's more or less the same stuff. Uh, we use more than one decision tree. We train it, we make majority voting for classification or uh, regression, and we make a final decision for random forest. And what we have is, uh, let's say, we are trying to classify fruits. Let's say the first decision tree said that's an apple. The second decision tree said that's an apple as well. But the third uh, or the end decision tree said that's a banana. And in the majority voting, since we have two apples and one banana, that's going to be classified as apple. So the difference between begging and random forest is in random forest, you are supposed to, or you have to use decision trees. That's why it's called a forest. But you still use begging. Okay. But as we did in our first example, with begging, we can use other decision makers. For example, we used uh, logistic regression, our first example. But in the second example, we used uh, decision trees. So that's that was a random forest. So we have advantages and disadvantages of random forest. I'm not going to go into the details. That's basically begging methods for uh, decision trees. And the difference between decision trees and random forest is this, this part is important. Decision trees normally suffer from the problem of overfitting, uh, and especially if we allow it to grow without any control. Remember from our decision tree lecture, if you don't limit the number of leaves or the, uh, the number of samples on a leaf or the uh, number of levels, the decision trees can go way beyond uh, their limit and they can overfit. But random forests do not overfit because we have more than one tree. And uh, basically random forests are there to make decision trees more robust. 
And the second point is a single decision tree is faster in computation. Uh, but random forests are comparatively slower because you use uh, more than one decision tree. Uh, as in the second example, they used 1000 decision trees. I mean, th this is supposed to be uh, much more slower than a single decision tree. Let's make a small Python example and it's gonna be more clear actually. We will be using another data set called uh, heart diseases data sets. And here we have age, gender, uh, some cholesterol level, some uh, whatever level, uh, whether the person has uh, heart disease or not. That's what we have. So let's say uh, we will be using all uh, four columns as independent variables and we will be using heart disease as the y value. Here we uh, drop heart disease because we will be using for the y value. So now we have our x and y values ready. Okay. And then as usual, we will be splitting our data into training and tests. We will be using 70% uh, of our data for training and 30% of our data for testing. Instead of defining a decision tree and then uh, a classifier, we can directly use random forest classifiers. Okay, Th this is uh, easier. In the second example we did, remember what we did is we basically use a decision tree as the base estimator and then we basically define the number of estimators instead of doing that we can just use random force classifier and then we can just make the definition we again need to use number of estimators and we can basically limit the maximum depth and other stuff and then it's just a matter of fitting to our training data. Okay, that wasn't that bad uh, computation wise. And this is out of big score. Basically, that means uh, we basically used some stuff for training, and out of uh, that stuff, we used some uh, data for uh, calculating the score. That's not bad. Uh, but let's use grid search CV to see whether we can do any better. If you remember grid search CV from our uh, previous lectures, we first define a decision maker. In this case, it's a random forest classifier. And then we define the parameters that we would like to search the best value on. Okay, We will be uh, choosing the best value for max depth mean samples per leaf and number of estimators so that will take a little bit time let's start that grid search cv we defined our uh, grid search cv now that's gonna uh, make the fitting once it is done uh, we will basically see the best score for that and there is one thing I would like to share with you. That's why uh, I basically use the grid search uh, CV. You see, let's use the plot tree function from uh, scikit-learn tree. Um, we will basically draw the trees 5 and 7. Remember, we have 100 uh, estimators. Okay for our uh, tree but we will just basically draw the 5 and 7 so 5 is something like this and 7 will be something like this so we use basically decision trees but as you see the 7th decision tree that we are using in our random forest or in our uh, begging method is quite different than the decision tree 5. Okay, That's basically the idea behind begging. Although you use the same weak learner, 
or uh, weak classifier since you are training that classifier with different data sets we are using bootstrapping to create different data sets since we are uh, training these models with different data sets we are basically coming up with models that are independently different from each other okay or almost independently different from each other so that's basically the idea behind begging and random forests now let's take a look at our second method of ensemble learning which is boosting so that's the most popular ensemble uh, technique it computes a weighted majority it can boost a weak learner that's why it's called boost learn okay and it operates on a weighted training sets now let's see how different begging and boosting is this this is a perfect image to understand the concept in begging we have our initial data here okay and then we create bootstraps different bootstraps from this data and then we use an independent models to train in parallel and then we make a decision by combining the decisions of these independent models that was the idea of baking now if you take a look at boosting it's quite different begging is parallel boosting is sequential you start with a data set you train a weak learner and by using the mistakes this weak learner did you train another model but you boost some parameters here it's it's the same data set but you boost some parameters and then you train another model and then from the mistakes we did with this model we boost our mistakes and we train another model and then the final decision is done from the final model okay so that's why it's called boosting so we boost our mistakes and th this is how it works basically we have our first models we have our uh, weights we find our weaknesses we input these weaknesses to the second model you say okay i am the first model i made some predictions and i know that i couldn't uh, correctly classify some of these uh, data in our data set so please try to boost them or please try to classify them correctly in your model okay so the second model tries to classify the wrongly classified data and it creates some weights as well then it informs its weaknesses to the third model and it goes on like that and since we have n models the first model tells its weakness to the second model the second model tells its weakness to the third model and you come up with a combined model and it's a generic algorithm rather than a specific algorithm boosting and you will see two different types of boosting with the same logic okay so different combined weak models are no longer fitted independently from each other that's important in begging everything was independent all the models were uh, fitted independently in boosting the fitted models are not independent from each other fit models iteratively such that the training of model at a given step depends on the models fitted at the previous step that's important as well each model in the sequence is fitted giving more importance to observations in the data sets that were badly handled by the previous models in the sequence so let's take a look at this example that somehow looks like the last image uh, of the begging we have the initial data set 
now we have a model we have a weak learner here okay and then with this weak learner we train stuff and then we inform our weaknesses and then we boost some data in our uh, data set and then we use another weak learner but this weak learner knows the mistakes of this weak learner okay the previous weak learner and it's trying to solve the problems we encountered with the first weak learner and that goes on like this and in the final model we try to solve the problems of the previous weak learners as much as possible okay that's how boosting works the basic idea behind the boosting so let's compare boosting and uh, begging again so that you can understand it in a better way we have our initial data sets okay with the begging we use bootstrapping to create independent or almost independent data sets from our initial data sets and then we train models independently from each other we train them in parallel with the baking but in boosting it's quite different we started an initial data set and then we try to fit a model uh, we, we try to fit a weak learner okay and um, we inform the weaknesses of this model by boosting some uh, data in our data sets and since some values are boosted or their weights are increased once we use another weak learner it will try to classify the weakly classified or wrongly classified data in a better way and it goes on like this so this is sequential we are trying to uh, train one we boost data we train one we boost data we train one and it goes on like this okay but in begging everything is in parallel we have independent models and then we basically combine their decisions okay that's the basic uh, difference between begging and boosting that you should know by heart let's see how actually boosting works let's say this is the first iteration and we have a weak learner okay and we made a separation like this so these are correctly classified these guys these minuses are correctly classified but th these three pluses are not correctly classified in the first iteration and my first weak classifiers then boost these three signs three pluses okay now they are more important and since they are more important my second week classifier will try to classify this correctly okay so this is the classification my second classifier did so these minuses are correctly classified all the pluses are correctly classified because these are boosted you see these are bigger than these two pluses because they are boosted so all the pluses are correctly classified but now the problem is these three minuses are not correctly classified okay so now i need to boost these three minuses and now my third weak classifier will be classifying like this it's gonna correctly classify these pluses it will be classifying this minus wrongly but these minuses will be correctly classified but these pluses will be classified wrongly but each classifier has something to say and once we combine all these classifiers this is our final decision maker okay and since we combined all these uh, three decisions we come up with an almost perfect classifier that's the idea behind boosting you boost your mistakes so that the weak classifier after you can classify them correctly 
Okay, now we will see something called Decision Stump. Decision Stump is a machine learning model consists of a one level decision tree. That's basically a tree with two levels. Okay, or one level, uh, one entry level and uh, one of these levels. So it's basically making one simple decision. Is the petal link uh, bigger than this number? If it is yes, that's Iris Virginica. If it is no, it's Iris Versa color. It's a decision tree with one internal node, which is the root node, which is immediately connected to the terminal nodes, which is its leaves. Okay. So decision stump is still a decision tree. Please remember that it's still a decision tree, but it's like the simplest decision tree you can have. Okay, now let's see what other boosting is. So begging and boosting are the categories. Okay, boosting is the name of the category. And other boost is one method of doing boosting. And we will be seeing gradient boosting. That's going to be another way of doing boosting. Okay. So what's other boost? Other boost is a specific boosting algorithm developed for classification problems. It can be applied on top of any classifier to learn from its shortcomings and propose a more accurate model, as we have seen in the previous example. When we group multiple V classifiers with each one progressively learning from the other strongly classified objects, we can build one such strong model. Okay. Now, for boosting, both other boost and gradient boosting, the basic formula you should know is how the error is calculated. Okay. It's basically, we have a weight here. And if we misclassified this function, this i, uh, whatever, th this is one function. Okay. This function is one. If we have a misclassification and it's zero if we have a correct classification. So if we have misclassification or we misclassified something, uh, wrongly classified something, the error increases. Otherwise, the error stays same. Okay, this, this is uh, the simplest thing you should remember about boosting. We have an error function. If we classify something wrongly, the error increases. If we classify a data inside the data set uh, correctly, then the error stays same. Okay. So Adaboost relies on three stumps. That's uh, one thing. And stumps are uh, very primitive trees and they are not good at classification by themselves. But the thing is not all stumps are equally strong. For example, this guy has a larger stump than uh, this one, which means this V classifier has more to say, or its contribution to the classification is higher. Okay, this is the second important thing: is we have an error function with boosting, and all the V learners has something to say. Okay, or uh, each weak learner has a contribution and their contribution depends on how good they could be classifying the space. Okay, let's see an example. This is our initial data. This is our uh, initial classification. As you see, this guy is wrongly classified. Okay, this is blue. But since the space is divided from here with our uh, somehow linear classifier, this guy is wrongly classified as well as this guy. So this is not a blue, but it's classified as blue. This is not orange, but it's classified as orange. So what boosting is doing or other boosting is doing is we increase the weight of this one and this one. And we somehow actually decrease the weight of these guys that were classified correctly. But the thing is, this is our initial V classifier, right? And this has the best contribution, the highest contribution. 
Now we boosted our uh, wrongly classified data. We apply another uh, weak classifier. Now we made a decision something like this. Now all these guys are correctly classified, but this one is misclassified. These guys are correctly classified as well. So we will be increasing the weight of this one, decreasing the weight of this one, and this is gonna keep uh, going like this. Okay, that's the basic uh, working principle of other boosting. A similar example, we start with a data set like this one. We basically make a prediction. We, we split the uh, data into two. Since this is wrongly classified, we increase its weight and then reclassify. Since its weight is increased, then the space is divided like this. Then this guy is uh, wrongly classified. So, uh, it, it goes on like this. Okay. You increase the weight of the wrongly classified sample. So this is uh, basically pseudo code of uh, other boosting. This stage-wise stage -wise additive modeling using multi-class exponential loss function uh, is the algorithm basically uh, being used for other boosting. The first important point is we have weak classifiers, okay? We have M weak classifiers and we have our initial weights. And during each iteration, since this is a sequential, uh, sequentially working algorithm, during each iteration, we calculate an error, okay? And we calculate an alpha value with this formula, okay? One minus uh, error of this iteration divided into the error of this uh, iteration that's a uh, logarithm so this is the contribution of the classifier okay and the weights are basically calculated from the contribution of this classifier if a data is correctly classified then the weight doesn't change okay because this is zero uh, then this part is zero, this is one. But if something is uh, misclassified, then this formula is boosting the next weight. Okay, and the prediction is uh, done by weighted voting. So let's see another uh, example. This is our original data. This is the first classifier with the contribution two points. 3-1 okay and you see these guys are uh, misclassified as well as these guys in the second classifier these are boosted because they were misclassified and our second classifier is able to classify most of these misclassified points but its contribution is smaller and all the things that were misclassified with this classifier are classified with the uh, third classifier whose contribution is smaller and it goes on like this okay the contribution decreases and uh, with each classifier we try to solve uh, the misclassified samples and once we ensemble them we come up with a stronger classifier something like this okay now let's try to see this uh, with an example how we can construct this uh, other boost let's work on an example uh, like this one okay so we have three independent variables chest pain, blocked arteries, uh, and patient's weight. And with respect to these uh, three independent variables, we will decide whether the patient has heart disease or not. Okay. So initially we assign the same weights to all rows. We have eight data, therefore we have one over eight uh, as the sample weight for each of them. Okay, that's simple. Now remember our decision tree lecture. 
we need to somehow convert these guys into tree stumps because other boost is using tree stumps right and in order to create the tree stumps uh, we were creating this table okay and the way we uh, read this is the patient has chest pain yes and uh, it has the patient has heart disease so yes yes this is yes yes you see we have three yes yeses this is yes no because the patient has chest pain but he doesn't have uh, heart disease so this is yes no if you take a look at the data we have two yes no's okay this this row and this row and the way we read this is the person doesn't have ch uh, chest pain but he has heart disease so it is no yes which is this one uh, there should be one as well uh, because it says it's two or probably there is a mistake and this is basically no no okay that that's incorrectly classified so uh, we have two people with no yes uh, sorry no no and one people uh, one person with no no okay so with the same strategy we create our uh, table this is still not a tree uh, that's a table with the same strategy and we use the same strategy for the patient weight as well and we have our uh, old nice Gini index to create our uh, decision stumps so we would like to find out which stump we will be using first since the Gini index of weight is uh, 0 0.2 which is smaller than the rest we will be choosing weight for our initial first uh, stump okay and once we basically make a classification by using just weight we have a classification like this okay the weight is bigger than this number and the person has heart disease it's correctly classified that's three that's zero this is four this is one we basically calculate first amount of say or the contribution or what we call as alpha okay so in this case the amount uh, the total error is we have this one so the amount of say is basically this number 0 0.97 and now we have our alpha okay and our initial weights were all equal but this guy is incorrectly classified therefore we need to increase its weight okay and the way we increase its weight is we have our initial weight which was 1 over 8 times e to the amount of say and in this case that's the initial weight that's e to the amount of say and that's 0 0.33 that was 1 over 8 now it's 0 0.33 and for the samples that were correctly classified we basically decrease the weight okay and the new weight is e to the minus amount of say and we come up something like this 0 0.05 but if you sum these guys up then we end up with 0 0.68 which is not one so we need to scale them and once we scale them our new weights are 0 0.08 0 0.08 and 0 0.49 so our misclassified sample is boosted weight wise and the rest are uh, staying either same or they're boosted inversely and how we use basically these weights while we are creating or recreating our samples we basically use this sample which was wrongly classified more than once okay so we use it four times 
for example, once we are creating our uh, data sets. Therefore, uh, its impact will be higher. Okay. Since these samples are all the same, they will be treated as a block and it's going to create a large penalty for being misclassified. So that's how the second classifier will correctly classify this guy. So we will be continuing with gradient boosting. So other boosting, basically in boosting, the idea was to use the mistakes of the previous weak learner to adjust uh, our decision or make a better decision in the next weak learner. Okay, that's pretty similar with gradient boosting with uh, slight differences. Gradient boosting redefines boosting as a numerical optimization problem where the objective is to minimize the loss function of the model by adding weak learners using gradient descent. And instead of adjusting weights of data points, gradient boosting focuses on the difference between the prediction and the ground truth. So that's the important part uh, or the important thing about gradient boosting. It focuses on the difference between the prediction and the ground truth. So that's more or less what gradient descent was doing. If you remember from our previous lectures, we were trying to go down the hill with gradient descent by taking the derivative. So uh, by getting the or focusing on the difference between the prediction and the ground truth, we are doing the same. And it relies on the intuition that the best possible next model when combined with previous models minimizes the overall prediction error. So that's a numerical way of doing boosting. And unlike other boosting algorithm, the base estimator in gradient boosting algorithm cannot be mentioned by us. We cannot change it. And the base estimator for gradient boosting algorithm is fixed and it usually uses decision stumps. It attracts uh, attention for its prediction speed and accuracy, especially with large and complex data. So I'm not going to go into the details of the pseudocode, but basically we used to have an error here. Uh, with other boosting, now we have a loss. And uh, we use this loss and we calculate this. Okay, that, that's basically the... Uh, difference between gradient boosting and other boosting. And how does the model work? The weak learners are fit in such a way that each new learner fits into the residuals of the previous step so as the model improves. So this, this is the initial thing. Uh, we calculate the residuals and we have an improved uh, model here. We use the residuals to make further uh, analysis or further predictions then its contributions comes to the improved model as well and we use the residuals of this model to calculate uh, a better model as well so that's an iterative process that's sequential as well as in uh, the other boosting methods we make a prediction, we calculate the residuals or uh, misclassified ones and then from these regu residuals we calculate another model and then from its residuals of the new model we calculate another model as well. So it goes on like this. That's an iterative process. It's going to be more clear when we make an example. I know the definition is a little bit uh, difficult to grasp. So let's take a look at this example. We have three columns. Uh, we have three independent variables and we are trying to predict age. Okay, depending on likes exercising, go to gym and drives car. Let's take a look at this row. Uh, it's false, true, true. Then it's age 14. It's false, true, false. It's age 15. So we have, we are trying to predict this and we will be using these three columns. Okay. Now, the first estimator, the predicted age 
at the root level is equal to the mean of the entire age column. Okay, and the mean of the entire age column is 40.33. Okay, and the mean square error uh, for all these guys is 577.11. Okay, this is our first estimator. It's basically using the mean of everything. Okay. Now let's use like exercising. Okay. This is false, this is false, this is false, and this is false. So 14, 15, 16, and 36 goes to this leaf. Okay. And likes exercise true. So 26, 50, 96, uh, 72, 73, then they goes into this leaf. Okay. And there's a mistake. This is supposed to be 74, that not uh, 73. Um, for this level, we calculate the mean of these guys. Okay. And it's 20, that's uh, 25. And the mean of these values is 58.2. Okay. So the total mean square error for level 1 will be equal to the addition of all nodes of level 1 which is this guy and this guy. Okay. And when we add them up, we come up with a mean square error of 415. And this is 415 is smaller than mean square error of level 0. Okay. Which means actually we are doing something good. So the mean square error is reducing okay the second estimator is going to be the residue h i minus mu of the first estimator okay so we are here we are going to find the residues okay and the residue of or the error residue means error for 14 is 14 minus the mean of this node Okay, which is minus 6.25 uh, for uh, 15 the residue is minus 5.25 and from this node and this this node we calculate the residues okay for the second estimator um, once we are using uh, go to gym we are not using the h value you see, with the uh, first estimator, we used H. Now we are not using H anymore, but we are using the residues of the first estimator. Okay. And since go to gym uh, false, this one, this one, and this one, we have three values for go to gym false. They fall into this category, but we are not using H. As you see, we, we are using the residue that's coming from H, right? And for go to gym true, we are not using H either. We are just using the residue coming from the first estimator. So that's how we create this tree. Um, when we get the mean of these uh, three values, we have 7.13. When we get the mean of these residues, we have 3.56 so first the h will be predicted from estimator 1 as per the value of uh, like exercising then the mean from the estimator is found out with the help of the value of go to gym then that means is added to the h predicted from the first estimator and that's the final prediction of gradient boosting with two estimators okay that's how gradient boosting works. Basically, it's not using the actual data after the first estimator. It's using the errors made by the previous estimator. So the second estimator is using the error that was done by the first estimator. And third estimator will be using the error made by the second estimator. 
Let's try to find uh, or predict the age from the first uh, estimator. It's basically gonna be uh, 20.5, okay, because it's the mean. So it's false, true, true. Likes exercising, that's, fa that's false. And its mean is 20.25, okay, the predicted age. The mean of true go to gym, it's this, this column. In the second estimator is, let's see, uh, go to gym true. The mean is minus 3.56. So the final prediction of this model. So if we have likes exercising false, go to gym true. And the final prediction of this model is 20.25. This plus this, okay, 16. Uh, that 69. So that's the age predicted from the first and second estimators by using gradient boosting. And if you do the same, uh, you can see basically the final predictions from this table. Okay, now let's go to the Python exercises. So the first thing we will be doing is uh, the gradient boosting example that we did uh, previously. We have likes exercising is basically the same table with this one. So this table here, uh, this four columns. We are here. Uh, likes exercise, uh, go to gym, drive car, and we have Y as H. Okay. And uh, from scikit-learn ensemble, we have gradient boosting regressor. That's what we will be using. And uh, we will be using two estimators, okay? Um, when we use two estimators, as you see, the predicted ages are uh, 38, 36, 36, 42 and you see we have a quite large mean square error and the correct numbers should be 14 15 16 uh, so we are trying to predict these guys and what we came up he is here with two estimators now let's try to increase the number of estimators with the gradient uh, boosting Now we have mean square error of 380, it's decreasing and uh, the values are getting closer and closer. And let's see what will happen if we use 50 estimators. We have 25 instead of uh, 14. We have 15 and that's 15 as well. So we predicted this correctly. Uh, for 16 we have something almost 16 we have 48 that's for 26 that's not uh, done in a good way 36 we have uh, 43 so it's going like this uh, so when you increase the number of est estimators basically we have uh, much better estimates you see we have for example 74 uh, 60 and 74 for last two guys we have 74 the, for the last one the 60 was supposed to be 72 but it's not too bad when you, when you increase the number of estimators to 50 then we have uh, something better okay now let's make a more complicated example this gradient booster is basically uh, um, manually written gradient boost example so you can basically use the gradient booster uh, from scikit-learn or you can use this uh, class as well they are doing more or less the same thing now let's create some data uh, we use the uh, diabetes data sets from our uh, python libraries and we split our uh, data into test and training. 
20% tests, uh, 80% training. You use the def default values and we define an evaluation function uh, that we will be using. Now we have an algorithm to beat. Uh, we will make a model selection with grid search CV. We will just use a decision tree regressor and we will use the best decision tree regressor we can uh, make use of. And we will be searching the parameters max depth, minimum sample uh, to split, uh, minimum samples per leaf. So we will select a fine kind of fine decision tree. Uh, for our evaluation and this is basically what we have uh, for the training we have the accuracy of 0 0.62 and for testing we have a very bad number 0.38 okay now if we use gradient booster with uh, 20 samples or 20, uh, 20 trees, sub trees. You see, we have a much better accuracy for both training and for testing. So that's showing us even if you use the best possible decision tree regressor, it's difficult to beat the ensemble of these decision trees. Either you use uh, gradient boosting or other boosting or baking, it's always a good idea to use the ensemble of these models if you are using a weak learner. If you are using, for example, a neural network, they are already good predictors. But decision trees are not really good predictors or logistic regression is not a good predictor as it is. So if you are using a big model, weak learner, it's always a good idea to use boosting or baking. Let's make an, another example with Araboost. Usually, we import our uh, libraries. We will be uh, using the Titanic dataset from uh, Seaborn. If you remember uh, that we had 15 columns and this many uh, rows. Let's check the data. Uh, and as we did beforehand, we will be dropping uh, the rows that have nonce inside so let's see for passenger class we have one two three uh, values so we have uh, let's let's check the number of uh, passengers uh, with value one two and three and let's see how many uh, different genders we have we have female and male as expected and we have 94 uh, male and 88 female and let's check the histogram for the age you see the distribution is around uh, 35 now in order to get something out of these data sets as usual we need to do some data pre-processing so that the data is uh, ready for uh, pr processing we will be using passenger class 6, H and survived uh, for our example so we will be using these three columns for X value and we will be using uh, survived as the Y value and in order to use uh, gender, we need to convert female and male into uh, numerical value as we did before. So with uh, label binarizer from scikit-learn pre-processing, we can basically convert uh, gender into zero and one. And X looks like this after converting that. By checking the shape of X, we have 182 uh, rows because we dropped the uh, rows with nuns. And we have three columns, passenger class, X and H. Okay. And if you want to get further information concerning the uh, independent uh, columns, you can basically use pandas describe. 
or uh, pandas info that will give us basically information that everything is either integer or floating point and then we get our uh, survived as the y value and when we check the counts we have 123 ones uh, people survived and uh, 59 people didn't survive okay now our data is ready for processing we have three independent uh, variables and we have one dependent variable we will be splitting our data into train and set test uh, sets 30 percent of the data will be used for testing and 70 percent of the data will be used for training we have this method from the previous example uh, which will be taking the classifier as the input it's training uh, the classifier with the train value and uh, for training and test sets it's printing uh, the accuracy results okay so that's the basic function definition now let's take a look at Arabus classifier. We will be using uh, 100 estimators for the Arabus classifier. And uh, that part I'm not going to execute because it takes quite some time. Uh, but then you should check the results uh, for training data. We have 0 0.92 as the accuracy and we have quite decent precision and recall scores when you check the confusion metrics we don't have too many uh, false positives and false negatives you see here and when you check the test results it's kind of fine uh, 0 0.74 we have with the other, bo other boost uh, with 100 estimators now let's do the same thing with uh, random forests see whether we will have uh, any improvements so instead of decision trees we will be using random forest classifiers uh, and we will be using 100 estimators with this that's gonna take a lot of time because it's using random forests uh, so I'm not gonna uh, execute this you can execute it yourself you will have the Jupyter notebooks but as you see it's uh, quite decent for the training uh, and it's fairly well for the test as well uh, it basically dropped a little bit but it's still fine now let's make another example uh, with gradient boost classifier As we did earlier, we imported from uh, scikit-learn ensemble and then uh, we make the definition. We use our uh, training and uh, x and y values and then we basically uh, use our principal function in order to uh, print the accuracy results for both training and testing. And as you see, we have uh, quite similar results for the grand gradient boost uh, with other boosting. We had 0 0.96 as well. We have uh, quite similar results. We have a better confusion metrics. Basically, these were 5-5. Five, five. We have less uh, false positive and less uh, false negatives for training. Uh, the test results are slightly below the other boosting, but it's still quite fine. So that was basically the theoretical part of our uh, boosting lecture as well the important thing is to understand the basic differences between uh, begging and boosting so for begging we have parallel data okay everything is going in parallel we have independent models we have a data set uh, and we create a lot of data sets from this data set and then we independently or almost independently train different models with begging but with boosting, we have a data set, we train something, and then from the errors of the first model, 
we create another model from the data which was boosted from the errors of the first model. Okay, that's the basic difference between begging and boosting. One uses parallel models, another uses sequential models and learns its uh, learns from its mistakes. Okay. So that was it for the ensemble learning lecture.